even though my wife is yet to arrive and will come in grand style, um, I think it appropriate uh, that we begin this situation. No event is allowed to begin by law at NYU Law School unless Monsieur Troy McKenzie presides over that particular event. He's the first dean who has managed to secure a monopoly of power over these kinds of introductions. And so what we now have to do is to see whether or not he lives up to the lofty expectations associated with his noble charge. Troy, you may take over. Richard, thank you for setting me up for failure. Uh, I, I, I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> um, a personal anecdote about, about Richard. When I was a student in uh, these halls 25 odd years ago, the, the highlight of gladiatorial combat each year was when Richard would visit to debate somebody on the NYU faculty. And we would all uh, climb into whatever classroom uh, was set out for that debate. And I, I remember one year, Richard, you debated Larry Kramer about something. I don't remember what it was. All I remember is I caught about every third word uh, in, in <laughs> in, in, in no, that was you, Richard. Uh, so, <laughs> um, so, but and and Richard, it, it has been a phenomenal privilege to be your colleague for these last fifteen years. Uh, Richard and I, I began teaching in fall of '07, and Richard was teaching contracts, I think, to the students in that section, um, and uh, and he was a great source of wisdom, and um, and probing as I was uh, setting off on a teaching career. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening. It is my pleasure to welcome you to NYU Law for the 16th annual Friedrich von Hayek Lecture. Um, I, I'm going to speak very briefly before turning the floor over to Richard uh, to introduce our speaker this evening, Henry Smith. Uh, Henry is the Fessenden Professor of Law at Harvard, and he will be lecturing this evening on the origins of system in property law. Um, it's our great privilege to have him here this evening. He is a phenomenal figure in the legal academy. Um, I'm uh, involved in the American Law Institute, where Henry is the reporter leading the charge on the new restatement of property law, which is a major and important undertaking, very difficult undertaking. And there really could not be anyone better to organize and push that forward um, uh, in the ALI. I also want to acknowledge uh, the Classical Liberal Institute and the NYU Journal of Law and Liberty. The Hayek Lecture was inaugurated in 2005 with uh, Richard Epstein as the inaugural lecturer. And it really marked the beginning of um, Richard's new relationship with NYU. He, a couple of years later, joined the faculty as the Lawrence Tisch Professor of Law. And Richard, as you know, co-directs co the Classical Liberal Institute here at the law school uh, with Professor Mario Rizzo. Um, uh, in partnership with the Classical Liberal Institute is the NYU Journal of Law and Liberty. Uh, law and Liberty is the first student-run law journal dedicated to the interdisciplinary exploration of classical liberal ideas, and we are grateful for uh, the journal's efforts in publishing the lecture each year. Um, one final personal note about Henry. Uh, when I was a young thing on the law teaching market, I was sort of still bouncing into walls, trying to figure out how to put one foot in front of the other. Uh, and Henry was the um, was on the hiring committee of a well-known law school somewhere in New Haven, Connecticut. And I remember being extraordinarily intimidated at the American Association of Law Schools hiring conference, walking into that room and uh, immediately feeling at ease with uh, Henry's ability to engage at a very high level, but in a way that was um, collegial, provocative, interesting, and also calming. 
Uh, he is not just a great scholar, but also a fantastic human being to engage with. And um, we're really looking forward to hearing him this evening. So, Richard. Okay, let me see if I can make it up to you. Well, um, it is really a very great pleasure uh, to be here. I want to thank Troy. Uh, I guess we've now known each other for close to 20 years and have always been amongst the best of friends. I will tell this little story about Troy, where we first met. It was at the Stanford Law School. This was in the age before wokeism had taken form in place. Uh, but Henry essentially, rather Henry, uh, Troy essentially violated all norms of the Stanford Law School by talking about bankruptcy instead of something else. And I thought he gave a simply wonderful presentation, which is why he ended up at NYU. Uh, <laughs> and he's been a close friend uh, ever since he's been here. Uh, when I run the class at the Liberal Institute, before Troy assumed his new monopoly over introducing all speakers at all times, uh, Troy was always my go-to person to moderate any panel on any subject at any time. And why is that? Well, first of all, he has two characteristics. There isn't any subject that he doesn't know anything about, which is a real advantage. And he has this wonderful capacity to draw out the best in all of the particular speakers who come before him so that debates become genuine conversations rather than adversarial appeals. And his skills as a moderator, I think, have shown themselves to great advantage now that he's become our dean. Uh, it's hard to say about a dean who's been in service for about what is it now, less than a year? Nine months, Nine months who's revered by his colleagues. Uh, but uh, Troy was so appreciated by the faculty that his appointment was a foregone conclusion and his performance is more than exceeded everything that we had expected of him. And he did not fall or fail earlier today. Now, our speaker is Henry Smith and time runs back how far before I know it. I'm trying to figure out when I first met you. I think it was about the year 2001 when I was dean, right? And you were up for a potential appointment at the University of Chicago Law School. Is that correct, Henry? Uh, I'm correct, but, you, you but I mean, I don't want to go through all of that. It, that did not pan out for a set of reasons having nothing to do with him or his intrinsic merits. But I think we became fast friends. He became an earlier and important contributor to the Journal of Legal Studies. Um, he has been at Northwestern. He's been all sorts of places. Been at Yale, about which we will say very little. He now has a professorship and runs an institute for private law at Harvard and laments with me that the number of people who are truly committed to private law as a first approximation of their academic studies is becoming an ever smaller circle of individuals. And Henry uh, is one of the very few people who has managed to keep the tradition alive and to expand in the way in which it starts to work. Um, it's hard to underestimate or overestimate, I never know which to say Henry's work. He has been a real power writing by himself on the relationship of rules of governance to rules of exclusion, which is in some sense embodied in the first important paper he wrote, he wrote many, on the semi-commons, which is a kind of a funny device, which is the property turns out to be in common in winter and to private in summer. And well, you have to figure out explanations as to why it is. And Henry has the following great virtue in his academic work. When he sees a problem that he doesn't understand, he doesn't go around and say, those guys are fools. They haven't figured out what my preconceptions are. He is an empiricist in the best sense of the world. He looks at these practices and desperately tries to figure out what makes them tick. And so his job is not to decompose knowledge, it's to add to it. And my view about it is that skepticism only gets you so far. And the great achievement of Henry is that he is a builder of systems and an understander of systems, so that when you read what he's written, you actually know more about the subject than you did before. He also has a tendency. I will say, evident in this lecture, for the metaphysical mysterious. Like, let me just mention, he wrote an article recently called Meta Law, something like that, in equity. And you know, I've taught equity and done it for 50 years. I never heard the term. 
Um, uh, but Henry managed to bring it all home. And his talk today is going to be about origins of system in property law. And I could say with complete confidence, that title is consistent with anything from radical socialism on the one hand to excessive individualism on the other hand. And so what Henry has done has set us up for a talk with a kind of suspense so that we have no idea where he's going to go, where he's going to come out, what he's going to say, and why it is that he agrees with everything that I've written in the last 55 years. This would be a false. So look, um, I want you to give Henry a thing because I want to say something else about him. Uh, he is the longest waiting Baha'i lecture. He was invited to give this lecture in 2020. And we were told that he wasn't vaccinated. We weren't vaccinated. The school was closed in any event. So it goes to 21. Uh, then it goes to 22. And now normally this lecture is done in November of 22. Uh, but the NYU gods on policies of vaccination and access have been off the world mad. And so we put this back to uh, March of 2023. So Henry, the statute of limitations has not run on you at all. Adverse possession is yet to give you a permanent right to be the only Hayek lecture going forward. Uh, but on this particular occasion, we are more than enthusiastic to have you come and to tell us whatever it is that you mean by the origins of a system of property right. Take it away, Henry. So hello, and uh, I'm very happy finally to be here. Um, and uh, after these uh, super generous um, introductions uh, from uh, Troy and Richard, I'm afraid that despite the drama in the title, this is gonna be a bit of a letdown. Um, uh, I, I will say, as, as I said, I was gonna correct Richard, uh, which is, I know kind of a dangerous thing to try to do, but uh, if I'm not mistaken, actually, uh, I, I met Richard, first on the entry level market uh, or, or sometime shortly thereafter in an interview context, which is interesting because I've met both Richard and Troy uh, in an interview context. And I will say that uh, being either on either end of the entry level is probably not the best way to meet people or uh, to have fun, but they were the two shining examples uh, uh, of how it could work, uh, that they were uh, such wonderful people and uh, so fun to talk to. And so it's uh, it's kind of moving to that, you know, we uh, have this little reunion here. Um, and so, uh, and I will say that um, uh, Troy mentioned the ALI and I will talk about that a little bit uh, towards the end of the talk. Uh, his leadership in the ALI has been amazing. And uh, I don't know how people uh, who have his level of involvement in the council and so forth uh, do all that they do. Uh, and I guess when they, uh, run out of things to do there, then they become deans. But uh, it's really, uh, it's really truly impressive. Uh, and I will say uh, that, um, as we'll talk about the the talk here, uh, that uh, I was very excited when I uh, was first invited to uh, give this talk because, uh, you know, I've always admired uh, the work of Richard and uh, Mario, uh, and I've always thought that it had uh, connections with uh, the kinds of things that I do. Uh, and after all, uh, he's not here, but uh, Hayek himself. And so this was a great opportunity to um, put some pieces together. Uh, and I hope that they actually do, uh, uh, they have gelled uh, and come together, but you can uh, be the judge of that. So once again, thank you uh, to, to everyone um, uh, for uh, inviting me. Um, uh, so the title is Origins of System and Property Law. Uh, I wanted to say Origins of Order in Property Law to sound even more Hayekian, uh, but um, I did not do that, um, partly because I think that would have been even more mysterious. Um, and uh, the choice of the word system is actually uh, rather uh, important and actually Hayekian in its own way. Um, so um, let me give a little introduction to um, the origins of this uh, this topic, and then I'll uh, sort of say what I'm going to say. And uh, then if you don't like that, you can leave and then I'll say all the uh, the details. Um, the idea of uh, even property itself, the idea of system and so forth, I mean, if you take these, these are actually kind of controversial words. Um, if you, uh, if you say 
that property has content uh, or that law has a system, uh, those, that, you know, people can get really riled up about that. Uh, and I'll explain why, uh, especially in an American law school, if we went to, you know, a civil law country or something, that might be a different matter. But uh, property and system are among the words that are uh, are kind of controversial. Uh, and this relates, I think, uh, to Hayek's work. Uh, Hayek uh, had many insights into the law. He was a very uh, broad thinker. Uh, and he came at it from different angles. Uh, so he was interested in spontaneous order, and he puzzled over how uh, law could be thought in, of in those terms. Uh, and he was very interested in the rule of law, uh, which was not unrelated to his interest in spontaneous order. And so he was uh, he came at it from that angle. Uh, and I'm going to argue that uh, those two pieces fit together uncomfortably, and uh, that we can actually um, uh, that we can actually make some progress by looking to yet other aspects of uh, Hayek's thought, which is the, his, probably lesser known now. He was very interested in psychology, uh, in evolution, uh, in systems theory, which was very uh, new at that point. Uh, and I think if we apply these tools to law itself, then some of the 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 piece, other pieces uh, in his thought, and I think in uh, American legal thought can be uh, put together better. So the first thing I'm going to do is to uh, go back to this uh, topic from first year property. If you uh, take, well, most of you or many of you will have taken first year property or you will have heard that uh, sophisticated people always think of property as a bundle of rights. Um, and, you know, early in my career, I was like, you know, I wanted to be like a really rebellious. So I, I was like, oh, yeah, that's that's. Uh, you know, we're going to argue against this uh, way of looking at it. I guess I've mellowed a little bit that, uh, you know, this is not, you know, there's something there, uh, but uh, there's something that's missing from this picture. And I'll talk about that. What's missing is, uh, ironically speaking, because a lot of the uh, motivation for the legal realism of the uh, 20s and 30s was the increasing quote unquote complexity of law, is that uh, the bundle of rights picture does not do justice to the complexity of uh, property relations or um, uh, in either a legal or an economic sense. Uh, and so then we have to ask, okay, what what kind of system, you know, you know, what how should we think about system in order to get a handle on uh, those kinds of uh, complexity? And I will argue, and I've argued elsewhere, but I will argue in a very specific sort of uh, um, uh, Hayek-inflected way here, uh, that law is a system, but it's not the kind of system that the caricature of system usually entails. So it's not deductive. It's uh, so you know, we're not looking for a bunch of axioms that we can uh, derive results from. We're not going to be Langdell, even though Langdell wasn't really Langdell, maybe. Um, and we're not uh, we're not talking about an autonomous, closed little uh, uh, universe. It's a semi-open system. Uh, and it's also not homogeneous. And I think this, uh, we'll get to this in a moment, but it's very important that uh, we resist the academic tendency to try to reduce everything to sort of one kind of thing. So the idea of the bundle of rights is, you know, well, you've got all these uh, like sticks and sticks are sticks and sticks and so forth. Or, you know, law, you have laws formal or laws anti-formal, and it has to be that way all the time. Uh, and so I'm going to argue that, again, it's a very mixed uh, kind of picture, but it's a mixed picture that has a lot of pattern to it. So that sounds all very uh, abstract and uh, Richard would say metaphysical. I'm going to uh, talk about some uh, concrete examples. Along the way, we'll talk about the um, right to roam. Uh, so if you're into hiking, uh, this is the, probably the most exciting part of the talk. Uh, and also uh, what's become quite controversial uh, and also in the context of the uh, American Law Institute, which is the uh, the law of overflights. You know how do, how does trespass law apply to uh, flying objects, um, uh, airplanes in an earlier era, and uh, particularly drones uh, or unmanned aerial vehicles uh, now? Okay, so that's where we're going, and so I want to start with the bundle of rights. Now, this is not the be all and end all of uh, of law or even property, but it is sort of Exhibit A for a way of thinking about law, a very disaggregated, very reductive uh, uh, way of thinking about law. It traces back in a way to uh, a, a thinker named uh, Wesley Hofeld from uh, who died in the uh, pandemic a hundred years ago um, and, at a very young age, 39, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and he came up with a very elegant scheme for analyzing all uh, all legal relations. Uh, and the idea was that it was sort of like a, 
a chemical periodical table of uh, of legal relations. So it was like the little, the smallest part. So if you say you own a parcel of land, actually you have a right to build on it. You have a right to park your car. You have a right to uh, uh, grow tomato. You also have a, a bunch of liberties too that maybe you uh, you know and so forth uh, that you uh, you can't sue anybody about, but you know you you you're free to do them and so forth. And th there are all sorts of these legal relations. I'm not going to go into the details, but the idea is that. Uh, ownership is not really anything more than the collection of all these li little uh, rights, and I'll uh, get into that uh, in a moment, but it traces back. It's not necessarily clear that uh, he, he Hofeld, uh, took this view of property, but there are hints that he, he would have been fine with it, but uh, that's for a, a, a Hofeld uh, talk, which this is not. Um, the legal realists uh, was sort of picked up where sociological jurisprudence and uh, progressive uh, jurisprudence uh, left off. And uh, so they were very um, skeptical of traditional baselines. Uh, and so the idea of ownership, if it could be broken down into pieces, it could be re-engineered uh, and so forth. And so they were, they had a sort of instinctive disdain for, for baselines. And they also were very su suspicious and sometimes rightly so of concepts that were trying to do more than they could. So they were very interested in very uh, shallow concepts, and I don't mean that in a pejorative term exactly. Uh, it's they they wanted, you know. So, for instance, in possession, they wanted they thought there were five or six notions of possession. There was no possession, uh, and I'll, again, I'll talk about that a little bit later. But they would also write case books that would uh, organize subjects like contracts around medical contracts, construction contracts, and so forth, and not around, uh, you know, consideration and uh, remedies and uh, excuses, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so it was not that that, that uh, kind of idea. But back to the bundle of rights, the idea is that, and there's a metaphor that goes along with it, this, which is bundle of sticks. Okay, now, you know what a bundle of sticks uh, looks like. Uh, there's one. Uh, and... <laughs> Uh, the, what's holding the bundle of sticks together? Well, nothing except the, the, the strings, okay? And you could actually easily untie the string to redo it and, and put it together. But the point is that the sticks themselves, uh, these are kind of, yeah, th these sticks don't really interact with each other. You know, they're they're just there, okay? And the only thing, that they're just close to each other because of the string. So what would we, if we really wanted to think of property in these terms and only in these terms, what would that look like? Well, you could um, uh, talk about possession, control, enjoyment, exclusion, disposition. That would be kind of the Roman law way of looking at this. Uh, that's still pretty high level. So you could also think about it in a more disaggregated way, which I can hardly read, but it's like um, uh, owner interests include things like to develop, to sell, to subdivide, possible reversion, et cetera, et cetera. And the state has the right to tax, maybe in a domain, et cetera, et cetera. And then a bunch of other people might have, you know, there might be a mortgage and so forth. All of this is true uh, in a certain way. Um, but the idea that there are these kind of little prefabricated sticks and they're just kind of mix and match and so forth kind of doesn't quite uh, doesn't quite do it. Why? Because some of these sticks are much more related to each other than others. So like if you were growing a tomato, say, uh, you'd be very interested in the soil quality and the water. And it's not like, well, you know, you got the water stick, if that even makes any sense, and you've got the soil stick and, you know, whatever. Uh, and when we talk about airplane overflights, you know, the low level ones, you know, like the stick, it, it, there's an individuation problem. Like, you know, how narrow are these sticks? You know, like the low level airplane or the aircraft overflight stick is very relevant to my other sticks, whereas the 35,000 uh, feet uh, flight stick, if that's what we're talking about, is not. Uh, and so, but this picture doesn't capture that at all, uh, you'd have to add on to it. You'd have to put, you know, some something else in there, like some glue or something, but um, we're not going to go there uh, right now. Um, okay, so uh, so there's kind of a nominalism to this, um, and uh, but it's a it's a very appealing on one level uh, kind of uh, conventional wisdom, um, and so ownership you can break it down and so forth. And you know, to be, to be fair, the, the idea of ownership, and we face this in the restatement, like, well, okay, what's the definition of ownership? So I mean, I think Troy will uh, was there uh, when we had a definition of ownership. Uh, and we made the mistake of actually putting it in one of our earliest uh, drafts. And uh, one of the people on the council said, well, this doesn't tell me anything. And uh, 
and it, everything was going to fall apart. And I, uh, so I, I came up with the kind of dodgy answer that, uh, uh, well, you know, ownership is sort of the entirety of what we're talking about here. So that's what the rest of this restatement is going to be about. So I kind of uh, um, pushed that off. Um, and that's kind of a property joke. But uh, uh, yeah, ownership is not an easy uh, uh Thing to define, but the idea that it consists of these sticks uh, is um, is troubling for reasons that we'll uh, keep talking about here. Um, now, one reason this is kind of strange is that uh, uh, one of the interests of the legal realists, and um, to some extent, um, the uh, to some extent, uh, well, to a very great extent, Hayek himself, is that. Uh, they were very interested in many ways in evolution. Uh, so the, probably the most famous evolutionary account of property is uh, Harold Demsis' 1967 article. But the theme of like evolution over time and evolution in the configuration of uh, what we have as property and so forth is actually a constant interest. And the interesting uh, idea is that this is, is only partially capturable on this bundle of rights picture. Uh, so before we uh, get to, to evolution, let me uh, sort of spell out uh, sort of Hayek being an alternative. Now, Hayek was not uh, a legal scholar. He did write a lot about law. So he was not sort of in the trenches talking about, you know, property doctrine and so forth. But what he did write is very uh, adjacent. Um, so as you know, uh, Hayek, like other classical liberals, was very uh, alarmed by the excesses of legislation, uh, and he tended to maybe overreact against legislation uh, per se. He tended to romanticize uh, the common law to a certain extent. He saw in legislation uh, a sort of uh, cart what he called Cartesian rationalism and constructivism, so uh, you know, conscious design and so forth. And you can see why he thought that that you know, uh, statutes are definitely a product of design in a way that, um, uh, say, prices in a market are not. Um, and uh, so uh, he 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 uh, was very interested in um, moving away from that model. And yet he was very also interested in the, the rule of law. So whatever was there needed to uh, satisfy some criteria that uh, he also was very interested in. So I have this quote from the Constitutional Liberty. So he, he said, the conception of freedom under the law rests on the contention that when we obey laws in the sense of general abstract rules lay down uh, irrespective of their application to us, we are not subject to another man's will and are therefore free. So the idea is that freedom is promoted by being subject to general rules, and the opposite of that would be sort of like an ex post, uh, you know, completely unconstrained uh, kind of uh, judgment. Uh, so there's nothing really laid down in advance, but you'll find out uh, after the fact. That would be the extreme uh, opposite. And he was worried uh, about specificity in the law that um, the more uh, the more specific law was, the less uh, the less you could be, the, the the more targeted it would be, the less the the more it could become a instrument for uh, uh, people to control each other. Whereas, uh, you know, abstract rules uh, would be uh, something that uh, you know you couldn't necessarily say uh, in advance. You know, whose uh, ox would be Gordon's, and so forth. Um, so, how did he try to put these uh, pieces together? Well. He saw uh, he wanted to see law as a spontaneous order to get away from the Cartesian rationalism, uh, and so and he, so he looked to custom. He, so he thought uh, of custom as a spontaneous order, and he noticed that the common law historically uh, was identified as custom, and so he built up the idea of common law as custom and the judge as sort of finding the law and so forth in a way that may have once been true, but is not true anymore. Uh, and, uh, you know, if we taught our students in the first year that, oh, judges are finding the law and the, you know, the, you know, it's really custom and so forth, uh, we'd be, uh, I think even our first year students would be looking at us uh, pretty strangely. So that, that has a limit. Um, and yet there's something there. Uh, not all law is uh, completely divorced from custom. Uh, you know, I've written about, uh, about custom. Uh, but what the relationship is, is, uh, is not um, entirely clear. Um, and uh, so, so when Hayek was confronted with the common law as it actually is, he started getting nervous that um, maybe it wasn't sufficiently general. Maybe it wasn't enough rule-like. Well, you know, we, if we do things case by case, and uh, it's not clear that this is uh, actually what he was talking about in the paragraph above. And so maybe there's some kind of uh, tension. Okay, so what uh, what do I think 
uh, is the problem here? Well, I think the problem here is partly that uh, Hayek wanted the law to be sort of homogeneous. He wanted it to do too many things at once. Uh, he, uh, in some sense, he was making overly ambitious uh, demands for what law uh, could do. And if we pick apart uh, some of these uh, strands, uh, then that might solve some of these problems, not just for Hayek, but uh, more generally. And how do we do that? Well, I'm going to put the thesis uh, out here that when we apply the tools of systems theory, complex systems theory, uh, we can start articulating uh, what is going on in the law in a more fine-grained way and solve or help solve some of these uh, problems. Namely, that uh, we should think of law as many other social systems as a complex system. And a complex system is one uh, in which you don't just have a whole bunch of elements, the sticks, for example, but also you know legal concepts or whatever, but they're interconnected. And the interconnections are what uh, causes both potential problems, but also uh, um, uh, helps, uh, if we handle them right, uh, make law work better. And again, I'll get to that in a, in a moment. Uh, but both realists and Hayek, I think, were not that interested in picking apart the actual way that law works. Uh, and uh, and I think that uh, is, is a big limit. Uh, they focus on, you know, what we all care about, which is the bottom line. You know, like what, you know, who gets to do what to whom and, you know, who's liable to whom and so forth. But they're not as uh, interested in how that comes about. There's kind of an assumption that uh, you put it, you you put stuff in, and it comes out. And uh, what's uh, going on in the middle isn't uh, that clear. Um, back to the bundle. Uh, you know, we could think we can we can describe property as a bunch of bundle. You know, a bundle of you know rights of you know, like you get to grow the tomato, you get to park your car, and so forth. But if we're going to explain uh, the patterns that arise and what people uh, tend to have to begin with and what they tend to give away and what which patterns of things they give away and which they don't and what people are responsible for and what they're not, um, we need more than that. Um, and then I, so I, let's get back to evolutionism. Uh, uh, Hayek, when he said constructivism is uh, the problem, uh, and again, uh, you know, it's maybe uh uh, not as always the problem, but he tended to see that uh, constructivism was overemphasized. Uh, he contrasted it with evolutionism. So the idea of spontaneous orders kind of evolving, uh, and you can think of custom evolving. Nobody designed by uh, customs of possession changed or custom, you know, various customs changed. It just sort of happened as people adjusted their behavior uh, and so forth, or at least some of the time. Of the time. So, uh, now let's think about the bundle of rights, uh, and this applies to all sorts of, you know, connections in the law, but the bundle of rights is great because it's so concrete in a sense, uh, you know, we know, uh, kind of what the stakes are. Um, also Mueller had this very interesting article. Um, it was actually presented, I think at NYU at a conference, uh, that, uh, Richard organized, um, on spontaneous order. Uh, and, um, the, and what they taught, uh, what they did was, they adopted a model from, of evolution from Stuart Kaufman, uh, the famous NK model, uh, and applied it to the bundle of rights. So the idea here would be, uh, this is the kind of diagram you get in uh, Kaufman's model, but instead of the basic units being genes, the idea is the basic units are rights or Hofeldian relations or what, what have you, but let's just say rights uh, or sticks, if you will. And one means that you have it in your bundle and zero means you don't. And the Connections here, so so the 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 conventional bundle would be that would be the the end of the story, uh, but uh, in modern uh, uh, models of evolution, Kaufman's in particular, uh, genes can be related to each other. So the expression of one gene can depend on its context, and one uh, gene can influence another, and so forth. They're epistatically connected. So if you have uh, whatever's I don't know if this pointer is yeah, if you have this one, then uh, the presence of this one changes what this one means. It's uh, and it's not like the effect of having this and this and this and this is just the additive sum of their individual effects. It's that if you have this one, but you also have this one, then that's going to be something different than if you had uh, you just take them individually. But 
this one is not particularly related to this one. So you could think of this as, uh, you know, my uh, reading a book on my land, and this is a drone flying over. Uh, that's another stick, by the way, uh, and in this scheme. And this would be like, you know, uh, commercial airliner flying over at 35,000 feet. Okay, that, that would be a stick too, right? But these are related, these are not. And uh, that's, uh, that's important because uh, this relates to the whole idea of complexity. Now, complexity theory is uh, something that uh, has tended to uh, has tended to um, promise more than it delivers, but it is a very uh, a sort of heuristic tool. Uh, and the idea here is that we have a. It's not like complexity comes in only one level. Actually, a totally different level. So one level is what's the opposite of complexity? Simplicity, right? So simplicity means that uh, you can um, uh, you, the, your system, and a system is a group of elements, whatever they are. So like in a car, it would be, you know, the brake system and well, it depends on how fine grained you get, but it's the various parts. So the simple system is one in which there aren't there many uh, uh, interconnections. Um, and if there aren't, then, you know, you can tell uh, what the contribution of any uh, given element is because it just adds up. So like think of the bundle of sticks, you know, if like the weight of one stick uh, contributes to the weight of the bundle in an additive way. There's nothing interesting going on. It's not like when you're, it's next to another stick, it suddenly weighs more. Okay, that's not the way that works. Okay, that's a simple system. A bundle of sticks is a simple system. At the opposite end, there are, are systems that are so interconnected that you push on one thing and anything almost could happen. Uh, and so this is popular, you know, like the extreme example is chaos, you know, where the butterfly, you know, flaps its wings and then, you know, something happens on the other side of the world or something. Uh, it, but the more interconnections you have, the more things could happen. Um, and uh, so uh, so imagine a car, if every piece of a car were related to every other piece, as soon as you uh, took it out, then, you know, maybe the whole thing would fall apart and so forth. That's uh, that's a pretty extreme uh, situation. In a lot of situations, and I'm going to argue that the bundle of rights is one of them, a lot of property laws uh, is two, you have something in between. You have a lot, lot of interconnection, but not a total interconnection. And the interconnections themselves tend to cluster. Uh, so the idea would be that, um, think about a car again, okay? The different parts of the brake system relate to each other much more than any of those parts relate to the windshield wipers. And so a car is a modular system in the sense that you have these subsystems where the various parts work together in a very intense way, but not so intensely with other parts of the system. And that's the key to actually uh, uh, making a car work uh, well. Uh, if, you, if you're designing a car and you're working on the brake system, you don't have to worry about every single other system in every other way because most of the action is within the brake system itself. We know we know the, the, yeah. that it's not unrelated to the rest of the car, but we know it's related in very uh, stereotyped ways. So that's kind of in between where you have uh, sort of organized complexity uh, in between. And also Mueller um, uh, uh, said that, okay, uh, that really plays out in an evolutionary way as evolution theory in biology uh, uh, would um, say that if we think about fitness and I'm, you know, we can talk about what fitness means in this context. Uh, you can call it efficiency, you can call it fairness, you know, human flourishing and so forth. Uh, but the idea is that if you have um, elements like the bundle of rights, where all of the sticks don't relate to each other, then you're kind of home free as far as making it better. Almost uh, you have to all you have to do is make each of these sticks better and then you've made the whole thing better. Think about a bundle of sticks, you know, like if you yeah, I don't know what exactly optimizing a stick would look like. But if you optimize all the sticks, you've optimized the bundle. Right, because you can't make it better, and you know. And the key thing is that as when you're optimizing each stick, you know you're not making anything worse. You're making that stick better, and you're not making anything else worse. And so, the the fitness landscape is uh, said. I guess Kaufman uh, coined this. Uh, it looks like Mount Fuji uh, from a distance. Mount Fuji looks very smooth, uh, and so anytime you change in a better direction, you're always going to the global maximum. Uh, your each stick in this case you make it better and you're just going up there. And uh, 
there's only kind of one way uh, to go. Um, if, on the other hand, uh, in the bundle of rights or in genes, everything is connected to everything else, well, what happens? Well, as soon as you move anything, uh, you might like shoot up or shoot down or just, you know, it's super rugged. Uh, and that makes kind of knowing what's going to happen very difficult. Uh, it makes evolution in certain uh, situations very difficult because one little change can just like uh, ruin everything uh, and, and so forth. Uh, sorry, that's the random, uh, 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 you know, it's like up and down, up and down, up and down. Somewhere in between, and that's this is a huge uh, rage, that's why I was kind of getting mistaken here, uh, is a, a rugged landscape where, you know, if you, you can go up local peaks and, uh, you know, if you made something better, you can sort of see, well, it's going to make it better, but we don't know if, you know if it's going to make it totally better. It could make it worse. Uh, it's a kind of mixed picture. And uh, also Mueller identified that with uh, my approach to the bundle of rights. And I, uh, you know, I definitely embrace uh, that. Well, what, uh, what, how does this play out? Um, well, this really, I think, captures something uh, important because the conventional bundle picture, I mean, if we go back to the bundle of rights picture or the idea of this without the connections or this would be the smooth uh, 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 landscape uh, there. The idea is that in conventional property theory, the idea is that you have one stick, one rule, one whatever it is, and it will justify itself separately from everything else. Uh, and this uh, idea goes back a long way. Uh, very famously, it was endorsed by Holmes uh, in The Path of the Law. This is one of the famous, maybe not the most famous quotation from The Path of the Law, but it's up there. Uh, and he said, uh, sorry, I got the, uh, uh, a body of law is more rational and more civilized when every rule it contains is referred articulately and definitely to an end which it subserves, and when the grounds for desiring that end are stated or are ready to be stated in words. This is like the most anti-Hayekian uh, view you could possibly take because he's basically saying we can analyze everything into its uh, its parts and we can optimize them uh, one by one. And he's not alone. I mean, I would say this is kind of the fountainhead of a lot of modern thinking about law where uh, the idea is that rationality requires us to rationalize each little piece on its own. The, the problem with that is that if everything is somewhat connected, uh, rationalizing every piece on its own doesn't take into account how uh, our working on one piece might affect the rest uh, of the pieces. Uh, the, this kind of super reductionism that is embedded in this Holmesian view uh, is an empirical assertion that I think is uh, actually not correct in many cases. Uh, and I'll uh, talk about that in a minute. Um, so the idea of the bundle of rights, and this goes for maybe legal concepts more uh, uh, broadly in legal realism, is it's a very disaggregated uh, uh, view. But it's very it may it makes uh, it, it it promotes a certain optimism about uh, reformulation. And again, I'm not against reformulation, uh, but it does it does sort of stack the deck uh, that this is going to be easy because we're climbing Mount Fuji and uh, where, you know, Mount Fuji is pretty tall, but it's not, at least, at least from a distance, it looks pretty smooth. So, uh, so that's what we're doing. Now, uh, in a complex system, uh, that's not true. Complex system, uh, the elements are connected. Uh, and the reason this is important is that the dense connections, however dense they are, the more dense they are, the more likely it is that we will see properties at the level of the system that we can't trace to the uh, particular elements. And some people would say that it's impossible to trace them. Other people would say it's just uh, very, very difficult. But think about you know, the wetness of water. Well, where does that come from? Well, you can't say, hey, there's a water molecule, it's wet. Or you know, wetness is a pop pr property of what water molecules uh, that we kind of add up and then it's like really wet. No, it's uh, that that's an emergent property of a, a bunch of water uh, or, some people would say that uh, the consciousness is an emergent property of uh, uh, of um, or mind consciousness of, of brains. And uh, the idea is that, well, it's not like, well, there's the pineal gland and there it is. You know, it's no, it's uh, that uh, there's lots of interconnection and the, there's an emergent property at the system that you can't see uh, at a lower level. Uh, and I would suggest that the same thing is true of property, that whatever we're trying to do with property uh, in terms of efficiency, fairness, human flourishing, and so forth, the idea that we're going to find it in the most micro 
uh, terms isn't probably uh, right. Is it the case that every time somebody excludes somebody uh, using law of trespass that we've got justice? No, uh, that's not true. Uh, the question is, uh, putting everything together, do we want to have this rule or that rule and so forth? Those are very different uh, kinds of uh, questions. Um, the, in a lot of my writing, I've uh, uh, argued that um, the uh, that the complexity problem is not something we should throw up our hands. This is not a council of despair. This is not the you know law is a seamless web, and if you uh, if you touch our sacred common law, you're going to make it you know always worse. Not at all. Uh, the idea is that law has a structure, and when we're trying to uh, do something about it, we have to take that into account. And what's the structure? Well, a lot of the structure is the kind of structure that we just find all around ourselves. Go back to the car. Car is a modular system in the sense that the brake system, the windshield wiper system, the security system, the uh, steering system, and so forth, they're all they all relate in certain stereotype ways, but the but the really intense interaction is within the system. So you have very intense interactions within components and then loose connections of the components to each other, which makes it much easier to redesign the brake system because you don't have to uh, worry about everything. Um, and that's a modular system. Modular systems are all over the place. Uh, and I would argue that uh, law and property law in particular is that kind of system. Even the idea of a parcel of land is kind of a module. Why? Because if I'm walking along the sidewalk, I know that I'm not supposed to cross the boundary. I know I'm not supposed to throw stuff in. I'm not, I know what I'm not supposed to do, but I don't need to know what the owner is doing or whether the owner is doing this or that or how they're exercising their rights. Or to use James Penner's famous example, if I'm walking through a, a parking lot, I know not to steal cars. I know not to damage them and so forth, but I don't need to know whether this particular car is on loan from the, the sister-in-law or this car has been sold three times. It doesn't matter. You know, that, that kind of information is, uh, is, uh, relevant to somebody, but not to the person who has to walk through the car park, the parking lot and, uh, uh, respect the duties. Um, okay. So how does it play out in uh, property as a system? Well, uh, once you think of it this way, the idea that uh, we deal with things like parcels of land or cars and so forth is uh, somewhat more um, understandable. Uh, the idea that the basic forms of property are standardized, that we have fee simple and life estate and so forth, uh, the numerous clauses, the closed number of forms, is, uh, is, which Marilyn and I have written about, yeah, that that becomes more understandable. That you know we want we don't want information to be relevant all the time. We want people to have uh, you know, very interoperable, you know, combinable interests in property, but not ones where all the information is important all the time. Uh, so for instance, to duty holders, to people outside, they don't need to know. Um, and possession, uh, for instance, uh, that uh, Richard and uh, Carol Rose and Tom Merrill have talked about. Many people have written about possession, but uh, the three of them have all written about how uh, the idea of possession is very simple. Even first possession, we kind of know without having uh, to know much, you know, who's claiming what. The messages are pretty simple, um, and uh, that's not an accident. Um, okay, so uh, uh, how, you know, maybe I'll skip over some of this. I mean, uh, the basic uh, idea in property is that you have a lot more complication when you're uh, governing particular uses of property rather than just sort of setting out the basic framework. Uh, so, you know, it, uh, all of the examples I've given so far have been pretty simple. You know, don't don't steal a car. You know, don't uh, throw projectiles into people's land. I mean, not news, right? Um, but, you know, there are more um, subtle ideas like, uh, you know, don't uh, uh, send odors of uh, over a certain amount, uh, you know, to bother that would bother your neighbor. And like recently in England, you know, like uh, what if you have a uh, a um, observation deck on your uh, uh, on your museum that you can see into uh, another apartment building uh, and thousands of people are posting stuff on the Internet uh, about these people in their apartment buildings that a nuisance. Okay, and uh, that that caused a big stir uh, in England. Uh, the, the short answer is now yes. Uh, people thought it was no, um, but uh, you can look that up. Um, also in England is a, a nice example, just to make things a little more concrete about the bundle of rights. Um, the idea here is that uh, the right to roam is a, a very important um, 
uh, custom in uh, Northern Europe. Uh, mo most of these countries don't have a lot of public land uh, the way the United States does. And so hikers will hike over private land. Um, and uh, recently in both England and Scotland, uh, the, uh, the, uh, there, were, there were statutes passed that codified these customary rights, but then but extended them uh, and made them much more detailed. Uh, and um, uh, Click and Parkamovsky uh, studied this and uh, tried to find out, yeah, because this was kind of celebrated. It was like, you know, wow, you know, who could possibly be against this? Um, uh, I had questioned whether the, the, this might have actually impacted owners. Um, I didn't say that this was uh, a bad idea, but um, they did find, uh, according to their study, that um, this did uh, uh, cause 6% uh, less appreciation, you know, an appreciation effect um, in uh, uh, as a result of this legislation, they did an event study, and yeah, it's interesting um, that that shows that this uh, that this right to roam, this roaming stick, if you will, was actually pretty interconnected, especially the way the statute was formulated to what owners were otherwise wanting to do, and it, that got reflected into market prices. Um, and uh, so, where does that leave us? I mean, it, it means that. If we want to have a statutory right to roam, we have to talk about it. You know, what what is what is really uh, is it really worth it? Uh, probably the custom was worth it. Uh, it was so well accepted. Uh, this might be worth it, but um, you know, it, it's it, it's a question. Uh, it's an empirical question, uh, and it's an empirical question because the various sticks are uh, connected to each other. If we had the conventional bundle of rights, the idea is like, hey, hiking's great, you know, and I like hiking, uh, and so. Uh, if we're optimizing that stick, that's that's that, um, but that's not uh, the way it works. Um, so uh, I, I think time is getting a little short. So I uh, want to. How, how much time do I have, actually? Yeah. No. Okay. I won't take that. Okay. Uh, let me talk about what kind of system this points to. Uh, and maybe uh, just sort of wave my hands a little bit at, uh, at how this relates to Hayek, and then I'll talk in very general terms about the the restatement and how this plays out. Um, that's kind of a work in progress, anyway. Um, I want to emphasize that uh, when uh, you know when people talk about system, they think, oh, well, this is like um, Langdell, or it's like you know nineteenth century German thought, or something. Um, and that's uh, not necessarily the case. The whole moral of complex systems theory is that systems come in all kinds of uh, varieties, and uh, they don't have to be deductive. It's not like this has to be a system of axioms. Uh, even notions like possession are very loose notions, as I'll mention in a moment. Uh, it's, you know, very semi-open, uh, you know, uh, when we're talking about um, even the right to roam. I mean, there's probably a sort of social understanding that this still draws upon uh, and it's not, you know, fully crystallized. Uh, and it's not homogeneous. I mean, uh, the idea, you know, I, I don't know how many times um, we've been around the block of, you know, like is property formal or it's not formal. Well, it is and it isn't. And uh, it tends to be formal when we have to deal with impersonal context. So when I'm walking through the parking lot, you know, in, in some sense, the, the rights are very formal. It's like, you know, don't steal a car, don't, you know, damage a car. There's not a whole lot of detail there. It's not very nuanced. Uh, but uh, when we talk about the law of nuisance, uh, that's a very, very different uh, uh, picture. Um, uh, I've also written a lot about equity, and I think equity is a very important theme that relates to Hayek. I'm not going to be able to talk about it in detail uh, today, uh, partly because um, I, I think the reason this is very important for Hayek is that um, the uh, so I've argued that uh, equity is sort of in an Aristotelian sense is it's not you know equity uh, in an Aristotelian sense writ large, but uh, what equity courts did often was intervene when the law was really getting off off track in a big way. Uh, the law was really uh, careening off the rails and uh, it would uh, rein it in. Uh, that view of equity, I think, is very relevant to Hayek's concerns with the rule of law and so forth, because uh, the, these ideas of the morality of the law, like Fuller uh, discussed and so forth, I think rest on very similar notions uh, that we have a sense of when things are very much out of their normal range, uh, where maybe somebody's taking advantage of the system, and uh, and we have ways within the law to deal with that, uh, with equity, which comes out in say unconscionability and the law of injunctions and so forth. But we also have a sense of uh, equity outside of law, where uh, we know when people are 
manipulating the law. Uh, Fuller has some great examples of this where statutes were designed, uh, you know, the uh, a formulation of like where this would apply turned out to apply to one city in California. You know, it's like, okay, uh, we know what you're doing there. Um, or, uh, you know, like some definition of like uh, to get around anti-retroactivity and so forth. Um, and this idea is not uh, something I'm making up. Uh, you can even find this in institutional economics. Uh, so like in uh, uh, Evner Greif's work, he, uh, he takes one step towards this. So he uh, does not analyze rules as law and uh, uh, institutions as merely a set of rules that can be translated directly into economic constraints, that there is something more systemic going on uh, there. Um, so if I have a, a moment, I want to talk about uh, overflights. This is too, too fun not to, and uh, this is where the I would say the rubber hits the road, but that's the whole point. Uh, this, this is uh, this is aerial uh, transportation uh, or uh, conveyance. Um, and uh, as some of you may have uh, studied in first year property or you may have read about, um, there was a lot of controversy in the 20s and 30s, particularly the 30s and 40s, about how the law should handle airplane overflights. Um, the uh, because at the time there was this idea, um, uh, sort of uh, maxim of the law that if you own the surface, you own to the heavens above and the depths below, um, and that worked pretty well because people were just basically building up and down and, you know, mining and uh, building buildings, but nobody was flying around uh, except in their imaginations. And, um, and so that wasn't a problem, uh, but then uh, people started flying and you might say, well, okay, what about, you know, 18th century France? Did they have lots of balloon litigation? And the answer to, apparently is no. I don't know why, uh, you know, the French seem to be fairly litigious and, uh, and, you know, who knows, but uh, it did come to the fore in the in the 30s and 40s. And uh, courts were very worried about uh, the law getting in the way of aviation. Uh, and they were very worried that if they said, well, you own to the heavens above, to the outer regions of the universe, but we're going to impose a navigation servitude for airplanes, that that would constitute a taking. And so judges, as they sometimes will, overreacted and said, uh, 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 ad kylum, that was the maxim, to the heavens above. Whoever said that? I didn't hear anything about that. That's just, or hey, yeah, that doesn't belong in the modern world. Who, you know, where do you get that from? And uh, and so the idea was that they kind of uh, um, poo-pooed this whole notion, um, uh, but they didn't really mean it. Uh, you know, you can still, you still have a right to mine downwards and people can't inf uh, interfere with that. If somebody builds a elevated rail track over your uh, land without any pylons on your land, they're trespassing. Uh, if somebody put, uh, does overhanging cornices over your land, they're trespassing. Okay. So the, the, there seemed to be a problem with airplane overflights. And what they, uh, they said was basically if, they weren't clear, but if it's high enough, then really it's basically a matter of showing substantial harm. So a landowner couldn't say, hey, I want to exclude all those airplanes at 35,000 feet because I am i don't like contrails or something like that. You know, you can't do that. Uh, but if it co comes in low and, and, and it, you know, flips out your chickens, which actually happened, uh, then, yeah, that's substantial harm. You can uh, sue for that. So they engrafted a substantial harm uh, requirement, but they weren't really clear exactly when it would apply and so forth. Well, then along come drones. OK, and uh, obviously cameras uh, from very high up, can, you know, very powerful cameras can uh, see down. And there's a big privacy problem no matter what our rules of trespass are. But this gives you a little sense, like with an ordinary camera, what the view looks like at 100, 200, 300, 400 feet. Uh, and there was a lot of talk uh, in law reform circles at one point uh, that maybe 200 feet is uh, the, 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 the level below which if a drone came in, it would be a trespass, no question to ask. And above 200 feet, you'd have to show substantial harm. That's a little too crude because uh, that probably doesn't work in rural areas. And uh, yeah, it, 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 anyway, it's it's a little tricky. Uh, and the drone industry wants to basically say that the navigation, the federal navigation servitude extends down to the grass tops. And so you have to show substantial harm, even if the drone is like almost flying in your face. Uh, that does not seem to be a consensus view. Uh, so that leaves us with a really big problem. So this Kylan principle, the above and below, is questionable. Now, this diagram actually kind of 
uh, is weird because it's uh, it instead of saying, well, you've got this sort of column going up and down, it's like you've got a cube or like a rectangular prism. Uh, well, uh, OK, so it shows that we have a problem here. Um, and uh, so the airplanes uh, tested odd pylon, but the, the it's really getting tested uh, with drones. And the problem with drones is that they interact with surface uh, uses much more than airplanes do at uh, higher uh, uh, higher um, flight uh, patterns. Um, and so what we so we we had a big problem with this, and we were uh, very much under scrutiny uh, uh, to do this. So what we uh, did was we tried to put all the pieces together using the concept of possession. Uh, and key to this is to distinguish between possession and the right to possess. Now you can say, well, you know, we often don't make this distinction, but uh, it's actually an important distinction. So I might have possession of my car, but when I lend it to, to Richard, uh, he has possession, uh, you know, we call that a bailment. I have a right to possession uh, in the sense I could get it back, uh, but I don't have the current possession. What's true of landowners is that as you go up from the grass tops or whatever it is, uh, as you go up, you actually possess the part that you're standing in, the part that you're uh, that your buildings occupy and some kind of bubble around your activities and the buildings are is actually possessed. And if a drone or anything else comes into that uh, bubble, that should just be trespassed. How do we know this? Well, this is a social understanding. You don't look in a, a law book to find this out. It's a social understanding and it's probably evolving. Above that bubble, uh, what happens? Well, that's not like anything goes. It's the drone operator or the airplane or whatever, uh, if they do something that substantially harms you below, then they're still liable. You have some kind of rights there. It's not the possession. It's the right to possess. Why do I call it the right to possess? Because there's one other key element here that's integrated with this, and that is the right to build up. And in the debate about drones, this is the one that's least often mentioned, but it's very important because the minute you ignore that, then anybody who has a regular flight pattern over something uh, will say, hey, you can't put that third story on or you can't put that 56 story on because uh, we're flying there. That's not the way it works. Uh, if you are the owner, you have, if you will, first dibs on uh, extending upward. And we have tried to build this into our scheme. So this is a, a I'm thinking of putting this in the reporter's note. Uh, this would be a, uh, this would be kind of a provocation to have a diagram and a, a reporter's note. But uh, but the basic idea is that you've got these zones, possessed airspace, right to possess, uh, where any of these buildings could be extended up there. Uh, and all of these uh, vehicles should not substantially harm uh, below. And then there's no possessory interest. Uh, at some point, this peters out. You're not going to be able to complain about satellites or uh, things like that. Um, and uh, that, oops, uh, yeah, uh, that's um, kind of uh, the way it works. I'm not going to go through all the language here for, I, I sort of uh, do this for reference here, but we distinguish the, the possession, the right to possess, and that allows us uh, to uh, then apply the trespass regime uh, in a more sensible way. The regular trespass regime applies close to the ground and this right to possess a uh, more ethereal version of it applies as you go up, but it works in a fairly uh, fairly integrated way with the rest of the law. And I, uh, I'm i getting signals that I have to stop. Yeah. Um, okay. But uh, basically um, this kind of uh, allows us to uh, look at law as a much more hybrid order. Um, and I think that solves some of the, the uneasiness that Hayek had with law on the one hand and rule of law on the other. And so I'll just uh, kind of leave that up there to. Um... I think it's time to put Henry to the test. Okay. I, uh, do you have a question, Mint? No, I was just going to. I what? was just going to bring the microphone. Oh, well, you bring oh. a microphone around. I'll... Since this, while he brings it around, I will ask the first question, right? Uh, and I don't know whether it's a constructive or a deconstructive question, such as the difficulty of my own metaphysics. Uh, but when I think about property rights and ownership, I think of it in two ways. I think that one is that which is acquired by first possession. And as you know, the maxim, you have the word in this thing, uh, possession of the surface is prima facie evidence of ownership and feet, right? 
uh, and so forth. Mm -hmm. But that sort of teaches you a very unitary version, and the model is everybody else has to keep off. But then you could create property rights by agreement, right? So you could create mortgages, you could create leases, you could create life estates, and so forth. And there's no natural order which tells you how the two or more pieces fit together, but there is a conservation rule which says the two of you together are not going to leave anything on the ground for third persons to take, and the two of you together cannot trespass on the rights of other individuals. But the various the varieties of rights that you have under this system can be highly varied, and so that system is much more complex than the other. Is that a way of getting at the kinds of things that you're talking about, which is a little bit more uh, closely tied to doctrine or not? Uh, I think I think roughly, yes. Um, I think that, uh, you know, when we're talking about acquisition, first possession is very important. Uh, there are some situations where uh, we acquire uh or arguably acquire uh, through accession. So uh, yeah. yeah, and so if, if your property generates uh, other uh, you know, like crops and so forth. Uh, you know, I would say about agreement um, that uh, there is a sort of view, and I think it ties in with the bundle of rights view that uh, once we talk about agreement, then we can do anything we want. But I think uh, the basic setup in property channels those kinds of agreements in certain ways, uh, as you said, you know, the, the tendency is not to allow this to uh, impact third parties more than yeah. it has to. That, I think, is very important. Uh, when, when it comes to, well, will they leave stuff on the table for other people? I think that depends a little bit on, you know, sort of what they're doing and how it works. There are situations where sometimes they might not find it worth it to, you know, scoop up every last uh, crumb. But the, the idea, though, is that, uh, like, take mortgage. You know, we have a law of what constitutes a mortgage. And if you try to create something that's kind of like a mortgage, but not really a mortgage, and maybe it's a mortgage on Tuesdays and so forth, the, the law's not gonna let you do yeah, that. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah. well, that was the next point I was gonna raise. Yeah. But when you start having these infinite varieties, uh, this goes back to your numerous clauses position, which in this case is so when you talk about easements between two neighbors, right. you know, the standard position was, is an easement to walk across a land? There's an easement to take a vehicle across the land. Uh, there's an easement to essentially take animals across the land and so forth. Mm -hmm. And what you tend to do is to limit them to certain kinds of standard types, particularly right. in the absence of a recordation system. Um, and I think the, that's the reconciliation. Uh, if you create complexity, then no third person will know how to deal with things. And so you compromise it in that fashion. Yeah, well, actually, it's, well, sorry. I, no, go ahead. Yeah, well, so this becomes even more of a problem when we get to covenants, because covenants can, uh, I, I don't know if Rick Brooks is here, but we're working on this on the uh, third, re, the, I show, gosh, uh, fourth restatement. Uh, and um, there, the problem is that uh, it, a covenant is, an agreement, a promise, or, yeah. or what have you. And yet, in certain ways, it's going to be given uh, property treatment. It will bind successors, it sometimes even impact third parties. And a lot of the doctrines that people don't take seriously in covenant law are there, in my opinion, precisely in order to prevent the covenant from being just any idiosyncratic thing. It has to really be tightly interwoven with the property in a format that's like property and so forth. And there's, you know, it's very flexible, but it, the flexibility is not yeah. un unbounded. And in a way you can sort of say, and this is kind of pain painting with a broad brush, that covenant law, a lot of covenant law mm -hmm. is there to ensure that this is not so different from easements. Um, and I think that's very yeah. interesting because it's- Which right is, And one stuff. fundamental difference is yeah. If somebody doesn't build high, you don't know whether there's a covenant on the land or not. Yeah, you somebody get crosses right your sure. land, yeah. uh, you're pretty clear that it's an easement. Somebody else have a question? Um, well, who's, yeah, uh, who has a microphone? Oh, okay. Oh, go ahead. Up you go. Stand up, stand up, stand up, and show us your face. Hi. Um, so I just wanted to ask you about your sort of equity as metal law, second order sort okay. of stuff, and ask you to put it in conversation with like a critique of positivism that uh, Dworkin gives in Rigsby Palmer, the, oh. the notion that, you know, and and also I want you to add, put those two things in conversation with like, like the new public nuisance, um, which is provocative. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so I, the new public nuisance is a big topic, and I, uh, you know, it's not unrelated to uh, equity because, uh, you know, equitable remedies are in play. Um, the, 
what what I wrote uh, in Equity as Meta Law um, is very related to Riggs versus Palmer. I actually have a section on that in there. Um, uh, and the the interesting thing is that Riggs versus Palmer is the uh, the murdering grandson uh, case uh, where the question is whether the grandson who murders his uh, grandfather in order to get the inheritance can get it or he he can't. And it's interesting that uh, yeah, Dworkin is only one of many people who've taken this as like somehow the the like test case for jurisprudence. And so you have all these like uh, different versions of you know like heroic judging and uh, you know textualism and this and that. You know everybody's talking about Riggs versus Palmer. Well, the thing about Riggs versus Palmer is that actually it, it you know it was after the fusion of the law and equity courts, and so the court kind of bends over backwards to call this a common law case. But uh, they're very clear that they're applying equitable reasoning, and it was a very established equitable principle that you the the principle that you cannot profit from your own wrong is an equitable principle. And I would hazard to guess that the uh, the Wills Act was published, was uh, passed against the background of that equitable principle. They knew very well that that uh, applies. Uh, and that if you treat it as an equitable principle, you actually get a better result, uh, you know, tr truly equitable than the the court did, uh, which, uh, as you will recall, the court said, no, Elmer can't uh, get it. So um, he's just out of the picture and it goes to the sisters, okay, which is not the way uh, equity would have handled it. Equity would have handled it the following way, that the legal result makes no sense. Uh, and so we'll do something else. So that's the meta part. You know, it's like we're at a higher level, we're intervening. And the mechanism for doing that is to say, yes, El Elmer takes under the will. And uh, there he is uh, as legal owner, but we're going to subject him to a constructive trust. And his only duty as trustee is to transfer to the sisters. And why is that better? Well, first of all, uh, if Elmer happened uh, to sell to a third uh, innocent third party in the before the court could have gotten to this, uh, that third party, if the third party had given value and uh, was without notice, would actually keep the property, but the proceeds would then be subject to the trust. If you actually start going into the details, it works out much better, uh, and it's a truly an equitable case. But I, my take on Riggs versus Palmer is that it's uh, so misunderstood in a way because of the fusion of law and equity, which I'm not against. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm not saying we should have separate equity courts, but I will say that this uh, this is the kind of problem that was very familiar and we had a very effective toolkit for it. And now instead of having that, we have uh, these sort of word clouds, uh, sorry, uh, of jurisprudence uh, over the same case. Uh, so it's kind of funny. Uh, so yeah, Riggs versus Palmer is like really exhibit A. Yeah. Yeah, we had one time. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, I, I think what you're doing here is very, very valuable. Um, build, building up a complexity systems perspective is exactly I think we should be doing. But I, I worry about about um, sort of the if we take the open endedness seriously, the idea of an ecology within a larger ecology. Um, so how far can you take law as a as a self standing, um, self contained? Um, system or self-contained theory of, of analysis. I mean, so it seems to me that if the formal rules um, not only depend on like each other, that is one formal rule depends on, on each other and their inter interconnections, also the formal rules depend on relations and connections to uh, informal rules and customs and habits. So um, do you think that legal theorists on the one hand should take those informal rules and customs more seriously, try and understand those interconnections because they could seriously affect the way that the legal rules what the impact impact they actually have in the real world, uh, and also, do you think that that could also suggest that uh, legal theory should work more with sociologists and anthropologists and people like that who actually study those informal rules and norms? Yeah, so this is a big question. Uh, it's uh, also a good question. Uh, I think that um, you know, I I am not saying that everything's connected to everything else, and that you know, yeah, I, I do think we can get a handle on uh, things. So. You know, in some of uh, my work, I've worked on custom and some on equity and so forth. And I think those are the places where the law interfaces, you know, the more formal law interfaces with um, social practice. So take possession. You know, like we were, uh, Tom Merrill's uh, here, we were working on possession for the, the restatement. Uh, should we like start restating the rules for how you possess a fish? No, I mean, uh, you know, people who deal with that out there, there in the world, the, there's sort of a factual possession. The legal status of possession depends on uh, applying uh, sort of um, 
uh, idea, a legal idea to that, but I don't think that, uh, you know, and maybe you can call that kind of a combination of law and social fact, but uh, but a lot of it comes uh, from social fact. Nobody, nobody, you know, wrote it down first or thought of it uh, in a legal uh, sense first. Um, and so the, I think those kinds of customs are very important. I, you know, in, in the law, there was like a long time ago, uh, people like Eugen Ehrlich, um, like a hundred years ago, were very interested in uh, the interface between law and custom. Uh, and I think these days, you know, maybe because custom is not as important and maybe because we're kind of interested in law on the one hand and social norms on the other, this kind of interface that is not as front and center, but I don't think the interface is like, you know, means anything goes or anything like that. It's just uh, it's been neglected. Um, Last question. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for breaking down systems thinking. I work on that field. Uh, number one, the role of uh, institutional, historical institutionalism, especially the work of Douglas North. Mm -hmm. How do you see that in, within this framework? Because I think it's very, he starts with uh, William Bradford and uh, mm -hmm. the debate about property rights and everything. That's very interesting. The second one is a futuristic question. There was a case uh, last year about. Uh, uh, IP intellectual property and um, patent right in an AI machine being mm -hmm. registered as a, an AI, I mean, a, a patent mm -hmm. creator. Uh, the course declined that, but it's going to open up another yeah. floodgate. It doesn't talk about ownership of corporations by an AI and later buying some copyright in the, in the like as a derivative right. So what do you think about that? Where do you think that's going? Yeah, uh, uh, both really good questions. So I, uh, um, I guess in some broad sense, I am a kind of a new institutional economics person. Uh, that's a big tent. Uh, North is uh, North is a very interesting example because I think as he, his work went along, he tended to um, move away from sort of laws as, as a collection of rules to law as you know embedded in sort of a cultural system and so forth uh and so much more like Greif, i think at the end of, uh, of uh, his um work and so so i think that that uh this definitely ties in with uh with that and uh, i think it's interesting if we uh, kind of go back over some of the new institutional uh economics work in economic history and start asking a little bit about you know like okay in a more articulated way, what parts of the law were doing what. Um, there's actually some quantitative work on, uh, you know, uh, uh, property, contract, um, uh, procedure, like, you know, which ones were uh, evolving more quickly in response to outside stimulus. And guess what? It's contracts, not property. Uh, property is more kind of in it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and as far as AI goes, you know, um, I think that's you know a very uh, intriguing question uh, uh, where we're asking about AI on the kind of the ownership side. What we still haven't worked out uh, completely is how to handle uh, intangibles themselves as property. And uh, when, uh, in you know in my role as uh, an ALI reporter, the thing that I think I get asked by far the most often is. Uh, can you own intangibles? What are you going to do about intangibles and, and so forth? And uh, we have a beginning on that. I think uh, we have some stuff on conversion. Uh, so, you know, I, I I will say that I am not against the idea of uh, owning intangibles. There are people who kind of, uh, you know, some people in England who say that if it's not if it's not tangible, it's not property, you know, sort of like the German civil code. I, I don't agree with that. On the other hand, and to get to your IP point, I think there's a very big danger that if we say in the restatement said that uh, intangibles are just like anything else and you can own them and steal them and so forth in exactly the same way, we'll be basically creating another IP regime. Uh, and that it's sort of IP by the back door. And that's definitely not something we need. So I think there are a lot of unresolved questions, uh, even with respect to ant intangibles as uh, as things. Uh, and then to layer on the uh, AI on top of that is going to be really uh, intriguing. So it's always important to thank Henry because we have to end. Thank you. When the conversation is still intent, uh, if I'm not mistaken, there is a kind of reception out in the back, right? To which everybody is invited. Um, and you can cover Henry with whatever questions you want. Somebody should ask him to explain more about his views on modularization, um, which I think are highly constructive in this area. Vince, do you have something to say? Yes. 
guys may know, I'm Vince Puzak. I'm the editor in chief of the Journal of Law and Liberty. Um, want to say huge thank you to everyone for coming. Special thank you to Professor Smith for an excellent talk and excellent discussion. And of course, thank yous to both the Classical and Liberal Institute and NYU Law School for making this possible. Um, look forward to seeing you all at reception. <laughs>